Stanford University. Welcome. Welcome to Stanford Medicine's Contemplation by Design Summit. I'm Dr. Tia Rich, founder and director of Contemplation by Design. It's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Tija Bell. Tija will be speaking to us about integrating embodied mindfulness, seven principles for actualizing the benefits of somatic practice. Tija Bell is a lineage Dharma teacher and Rinzai Zen master, the 84th ancestor of Lin Chi Yichuan's Chan lineage. Tisha Bell's name as a Zen master is Fudo Miu Roshi. He is a sixth degree black belt in Aikido and a lifelong practitioner and teacher of Chinese internal arts and Qigong. Teaching internationally in China and Europe, Tisha integrates meditation, Dharma, with Qigong, Nigong somatic skills as embodied mindfulness. He conducts teacher trainings and in-depth practice sessions along with regular online classes and has taught over 150 retreats at Spirit Rock Meditation Center in Marin County since 1999. Tisha is committed to the lifelong pursuit and mastery of these evolving teachings and disciplines as well as the ethical and empowering communication and transmission of their essential qualities for universal benefit. Welcome, Tija Bell. Thank you, Tia. Wonderful to be here with you today and with our community online. Today's lecture is about integration and integrating embodied mindfulness. So I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to share with you my perspective and my experience in these things. So when you hear the term integrating and you hear the term embodied and you hear the term mindfulness, these are all common and part of our modern parlance, are they not? And because of that, it's easy to not fully understand what the meaning of these symbols are, integrating embodied mindfulness. So I want to take a few moments and share with you at least the ground of this, and then we'll come into some principles that will contribute, I know, to the practice that you may undertake. I've called that here, I've called that somatic practice. That's just our way of saying uh, the ancient forms of what's called Tao Yin and Qigong. In relationship to Tao Yin and Qigong, there is also Negong, which is the internal aspect of that, of that aspect of integrating practice. Now, the ancient Chinese, our Chinese sisters and brothers, didn't necessarily use the word integrating, but they may have seen the practices as one of bringing about greater internal unity a harmony within ourselves and also with the universe. So to integrate something, of course, is to bring it and make it a part. And when we make it a part in the embodying way, we're bringing it into this whole system of our unique human life. That's the aspect of integrating embodiment. When I talk about mindfulness, mindfulness has become more commonly known and used in meditation practices and Buddhist and Taoist practices and even in uh, other systems of religious and non-religious secular practice. 
So mindfulness, we will come to uh, investigate together, is a way of being with your experience. And being with that experience without a kind of projection about what it should or should not be. So it is a skill. Mindfulness is a skill and a form of practice that we can use in seated forms of, of meditation, but also in the moving forms, the Tai Chi, the Qigong, and the ways that we can investigate that as a value and valuable practice for uh, making our lives and contributing to the life-affirming nature of, of wholeness that takes place when we, when we practice in this integrated way. When we investigate the, the various principles, these are not certainly the only principles of our Qigong, but they are foundational aspects that when you bring them into the flow of your practice, they deeply contribute to the contemplative nature or the, the meditative nature of our practice. The contemplative aspect helps to bring about that coherency is the word that I like to use. It brings about coherency through the whole system of our being. And that is the heart mind, spirit, and certainly the physical body. When we talk about our principles, when we work with the principles, I lay them out as seven principles, but they are not necessarily principles that are linear in nature. So we can think of them, I, I think quite skillfully, in a circular manner. Just like the Enzo in Zen, uh, in a sense, has no beginning and no end. So these are nonlinear in that sense, and they are also not sequential in that sense, even though sometimes the practices and the arising of the awareness of the principles will take place in a sequential way. I've practiced... Aikido over my lifetime. And since 1971, I began the practice of Aikido. Those of you that are familiar with that as, a, as an art might be thinking of it as a martial art, but it is also quite importantly a practice of transformation. And that is an internal transformation. The, the Taoists have the same thing. They have what they know as their internal alchemy. And that internal alchemy works with essential principles and practice to help to transform consciousness. Well, it's not just transforming consciousness. It's transforming our biology. It's transforming our, our neurobiology. It transforms the way that we are in our being so that the senses and the, our thinking is optimal. It's not about, good thinking is not about uh, what you think. Well, it is that too, but also how you think and how you're organizing the structure of your thoughts, the fair-mindedness, the principles that you're using in terms of clarity and precision those kinds of standards of good thinking. Now, our, our practice will be one, as Morie Weishiba said, that Aikido is the practice of principle. When we practice our Qigong, and Qigong, as probably most of you know, is translated as Qi, being the energy of life, uh, by any name. Uh, it could be, you know, qi or chi or energy or bioelectrical energy, but it has an inherent nature of intelligence to it. And chi is connected with what's called li 
in Chinese, which are the organizing principles of the universe. So it's not that complex in a certain way. We understand that, you know, you take an acorn seed and you're going to plant that, you will get an oak tree. You don't get an elm from an acorn. That is working with the energy of the universe and the organizing principles around the form, the structure, the form and the flow of our, uh, of our life as embodied beings, as manifest beings here on this amazing planet Earth. In this amazing universe that we find ourselves in this great mystery. So in a moment we'll begin to look a little bit at the at these principles of uh, engagement with the Qigong. So the Qi being that life force and the Gong being the engagement, the interaction with the Sometimes it's the shorthand of that is work. So chi work, it's the way that we engage in that embodiment to bring about the benefit and the value of those particular practices. If we think of qigong as the energy engagement, it's different in the forms and in the process than just exercise. So our Qigong is not just about doing some forms and having some structure with the body. It is that, plus the engagement of our energy, of our life force. So the three primary aspects that we bring together that help to create a unity in the practice are this aspect of the intention of our engagement with the activity that we're going to call Qigong. It is also then working with the breath. So there's a unification between intention and breath and that together with the skill of the practice potentially bring together a unification of this whole system of our human being in such a way that, that it definitely contributes to settling. And in our times, you know, the, where, where there's so much stress, it is um, about bringing together and mitigating that to a certain degree so that we can have the sense of alignment. The sense of alignment with our, ourselves, which is sometimes called centering. So centering is not just being in one part of the body. It's also having the sense of this vertical alignment through the core of our being. So I will refer to that in the practicum as the central column. So the column is not just the, the structure of the spine, but the whole fabric of our human being as it settles down, energetically connects with the earth, and then also energetically opens up, upward into the universe. So it's very grounding to, to feel this central column. In fact, if you take a moment just right now, however you may be listening and sitting, if you can feel the, the center line like a plumb line that flows through the core of your body and allow your structure, allow your body to just come into harmony with that. So it'll have a natural sense of lift and openness. It'll have a natural sense of settledness when we connect with these elements of alignment. Then in doing that, you can feel more at home in your body. Those of you that are academics, the, the, the great deal of your important work in your life is conceptual, 
is in the head is activating very wonderfully, hopefully, for you and your students or those around you that you work with in a way that expresses your, the essential qualities that you want to express. But settling into the body also allows the expression, the connection to be uh, more full, more complete, and more integrated. Not just concept, but direct experience. So that's the nature of Qigong. That's the nature of our somatic practice. It's somatic because it's feeling the whole system of our being. And as we explore now the, the principles, we'll have the opportunity then to feel into and right away get the sense of what is the potential value of connecting here. So these practices that have been cultivated over the millennia have also evolved. They've changed as they have grown from this tradition to that tradition. The Buddhists, when they came to China, they met a welcoming body of Taoists who had certain kind of yogic practices that we now call Qigong that were then most likely called Tao Yin. And the other word that I used was negong, N-E-I, gong, G-O-N-G. So negong is the internal aspect of our practice, the internal art, the internal presence, contemplative presence that, that also integrates the weave of those three elements that we talked about, breath, intention, and the skill of the action. So it can be a little bit confusing to understand, well, what's the difference between Qigong and Negong? And in some ways, there is no difference. It's a contextual thing. So if those words are newer to you, uh, just stay with me a little bit. Hopefully, over time and practice, you'll get to understand both cognitively and experientially the unique difference between Qigong and Negong and their essential unity at the same time. So I'll refer to our practices as, uh, as Qigong. When we do our seated forms of practice, which we'll do in our practicum, that's also going to be called Negong or Dao Yin. So, The other nature that I wanted to share with you about how we're learning about this deeply beautiful and uh, positively impacting somatic practice is that you learn in layers. It's not just appropriating and having all the concepts and the steps lined up. As I said, it's, not, it's non-sequential sometimes and non-linear. That doesn't mean that when we're learning, we don't take care to connect with the, the parts, learn the parts, uh, integrate the parts, bring them together, and then practice them as a whole system. That's what we do. In fact, in all the systems of Tai Chi, you must differentiate, that is to practice the, the essential elements of the practice and then integrate them. And it is through that integration that the value of the practice, not just cognitively, but through the whole system of our human being, neurologically, uh, physiologically, biologically, <laughs> however we want to speak about that, takes place as a transformative action. And those transformative actions, this is not magic, by the way. This is science. This is, this is the weave of the contemplative aspect into and through the fabric. 
working with science, but also working with contemplation and the value of that so that experience and first person awareness, uh, the way that we perceive inside and learn how to trust that becomes absolutely core to an effective practice. That's true of meditation that I've taught and been part of and practiced myself over the decades, and also the integration of these practices that I, that I teach and practice myself uh, and practice myself every day. I think that's a good introduction to the connection of meditation or contemplation with our integrative practice that the somatic practice which I'm calling Qigong. So what I'd like to do now is to present to you these seven principles. And we'll look at these seven principles and I'll read them to you and then get into them kind of as I was saying, you deconstruct and then reconstruct. That's the, that's the way of engaging with this, so that it's not just words where you're left to, uh, to wonder about what the meaning of them is. I'll read this, and then, we'll, um, then I'll uh, talk a little bit about it. Let relaxed intention direct, guide, and inform movement. Undertake your actions with ease rather than forcefulness. Let your intention rather than willpower guide your movements. Presence awareness into and through your action helps to bring about ease and to create calm. Contemplation and meditation have always been a little bit revolutionary because it changes, it changes us in a very wonderful, profound way that brings us more into harmony with ourselves and really in harmony with other human beings and with nature. So when I say let relaxed intention guide, direct, and inform your movement. This is a foundational aspect of creating efficacy in your Qigong so that you know it's not just about a top-down. It's not just a conceptual understanding and then trying to have your body do various movements. There will be an integration of motion connected with the flow of breath and the uh, that intention that makes all the difference in a good Qigong practice, in a practice that truly transforms and integrates our biology. So I say, uh, let your intention rather than willpower guide. When I'm talking about that, we have a way of, in our culture especially, of using willpower to kind of force our way through the various challenges that we have. And there, are, there is a place for willpower. But in the practice of the trans transformation that we're doing in our Qigong, well, what we're looking for is what genuinely works here, what's really practical on the level of that genuine transformation. So we want to investigate for ourselves what relaxed intention in this movement means. We're not in this relaxation, we're not softening too much. But there is a kind of balance and harmony that we can come to know as a direct experience and a concept, but more importantly, as a direct experience. 
So balance itself, as we will come to understand through, the, through this, is not a static state. Balance is a fluid state. When you see the natural sine wave, the, the flow of movement, it has its yin quality, its receptive quality, it has its positive outgoing and extending quality as well. I use the term presence awareness. I say presence awareness into and through your action. Doing that helps to bring about ease and creates calm. So I'll talk about presence awareness in just a moment, but creating calm is not just about a sleepiness. <laughs> it is about a kind of poise of presence that we learn to cultivate, which allows the greater cognitive functioning and also allows a greater uh, capacity for physical response. As a martial artist over my lifetime, understanding the need for calmness, it can sometimes be not exactly the right word, but I invite you to feel that the difference between being calm and tense in interacting in relationship. So when you, when you connect with that calmness, there is a way in which your ability to respond appropriately, which is what Zen in a certain way is all about, that appropriate response will happen both in speech, my, uh, you know, through your, through your actions, in your thoughts, not as some kind of rigid belief system. It's not about that at all. There's nothing in Qigong or really in Dharma practices, in Buddhism or Taoism, to believe. These are very practical-based systems that allow our engagement to happen in such a way that we can feel directly the impact of our speech, our, our movement, our actions, our interactions, and of course, our thoughts. But presence awareness as a term has a couple of different potential meanings. To presence awareness, is bringing the quality of attention or awareness itself to something. Your presencing your awareness right now as we are engaging in this listening. You presence your awareness in your contemplative practices, in your mindfulness, by bringing a quality of that, uh, of your attention, into and through whatever it is you're bringing your attention to. That's one aspect of presence awareness. Now another aspect of presence awareness is when you think of those two words, presence awareness. It is the field of awareness without necessarily directing it towards an object. In our meditative practices that we will do together, I'll help to point out that direct deep witness that is presence awareness in that sense. We presence awareness to things. We experience presence awareness as the field of contemplative being. So that's the best I can do with words at this point in the connection of um, presence awareness to its two profound meanings in relationship to allowing uh, and letting relaxed intention help to bring about and guide and direct our movement. Those of you that may have practiced Tai Chi, that opening gesture of lifting here in the, in the salutation that is in most all forms of Tai Chi, 
that's a sense of connecting with that relaxed intention. It's not just like do this, do this, do that, do that, this form, that form. But we're connecting in an embodied sense, not so much that I am lifting, but allowing that opening, expanding being. It's experientially different, is it not? To just lift your hand up and then to feel, to allow that relaxed intention to guide the movement. Now, I'm demonstrating it and perhaps you're feeling it in this, in this way, this kind of soft. And does that mean that everything that we do has to be soft and Tai Chi-ish? Well, of course not. When you're walking through the streets of the city and you're walking through the intersection and you have, sometimes you have to move fast. Other situations you have to move fast. But the relaxed presence of attention actually allows you to move skillfully and very fast when you need to. And it, it's not filtered through the cognitive practice, the cognitive state where you think, I, I better move. It's just you're moving. You're moving in appropriate relationship to the circumstance that you're in. So letting relaxed intention uh, direct guide and inform the movement, uh, I want to invite you just to explore that. And as we do in our practicum over the next few days, we'll continue to integrate the meaning of the, of the principles and how relaxed intention can really bring about a greater efficacy in the forms that we'll be engaging with. So that's the first principle. Let relaxed intention guide direct. Okay. This principle says, be present. This is the meditative pr practice of relaxing awareness into the now. This is known as essential mindfulness. Cultivation of the breath is used to enhance and stabilize mindful awareness. Unify your body, unify your mind and body with the breath. This opens you to presence awareness to the direct experience of feeling, the inner, inter, and intra-connection, connectedness of spirit, energy, mind, body, through natural, expansive, focused attention. Well, I know that you, that, you know, since the 60s, we've heard, be here now, be present, and sometimes you hear relaxing into the now and it can seem a bit trite. But as a direct experience, it is always fresh. So if we can get past, <laughs> get past that threshold of the, uh, the triteness of the language and understand what the language is pointing to, I think that's very useful. It keeps it fresh and useful. Meditative practice of relaxing awareness into the presence, into the now, is what uh, we do in Zen, is what, what you do in Zen, is what we do in Vipassana. And this is indeed known as essential mindfulness. This mindfulness is what I referred to in the first principle as presence awareness. Now, cultivation of the breath is used to enhance and stabilize mindful awareness. In the Vipassana tradition, which I've had the great privilege to teach in over the last uh, 20 plus years, they have what's called the anapanasati, which is mindfulness of the breath. And this is a fantastic contemplative practice. Maybe many of you do it or have done it. It's part of the greater sutra or sutta of the satipatthana or the mindfulness 
presence of mindfulness uh, teaching. Cultivation, on the other hand, is not encouraged in the actual practice of mindfulness. In other words, when you're practicing mindfulness of the breath, you're engaged in just being with what is arising. You're not trying to have some experience. You're not trying to make something happen. You're not trying to direct the in and out qualities of your breath. But the cultivation aspect has been part of these amazing traditions, Buddhist, Taoist, many others throughout the world. Various indigenous cultures have ways of practicing, coming into harmony with themselves and with the universe. When we cultivate the breath, we take these moments to feel both the qualities, to enhance the, the, the dynamic capacity of your breath, to feel into the rhythm, to feel into certain qualities that we want to actually enhance. There is a word in the Pali and in the Sanskrit that's known as bhavana. And bhavana is a word that has been translated in the West as meditation. So bhavana is actually an aspect of cultivation, of meditation as cultivation. And in the big picture, of course, meditation is a cultivation of our spiritual life, of our being in that sense. We take the opportunity to cultivate qualities of the breath. We take the opportunity to enhance the dynamics that are, that are present in breathing so that our meditative practice is not limited by how we breathe. So the, you know, the yogis have had the practices of pranayama. And the Taoists, and to a certain degree the Buddhists, in their practice have a way of cultivating breath in such a way that contributes to clarity of mind, to clarity of the system, and really allows you to settle into and to rest into presence, to rest into presence awareness. So as we rest into presence awareness, that's a direct experience that is not an idea. We use the idea as the pathway to open into the direct experience. So cultivation of the breath enhances and stabilizes this mindful presence. Our practice, however we want to, to speak about it, we can talk about it as an alchemical process. A transformative process is, in some ways, an alchemical process that changes the intra-dynamics of the connections inside our bodies. And as my... Uh, Good friend, Dr. Dan Siegel, who I'm sure many of you know, likes to say, the neurons that fire together, wire together. And what he's talking about is helping to build that natural coherency through our nervous system, brain nervous system complex. When we do that, that the interconnections that's not just about the nervous system. That's about everything that's connected to the nervous system, which in our human life is everything. <laughs> so we have the internal organs, we have the viscera, we have the blood, we have the muscles, the bones, the myofascial planes, the interstitium, all of this stuff you know. And the 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 contemplative practices, all of them that we do, will contr 
contribute in one way or another to this amazing transformation that we sometimes call calmness, equipoise, you know, being present. Even in being present, thoughts will arise. This is not about being without thoughts, but moving the locus of your attention just slightly forward to the uh, to presence itself, to presence awareness itself. And I hope that you will experience, and many of you already do, that this is a relatively easy process when you can understand the differentiation of the flow of thought, memory, sensation with the, with the witness, with the deeper presence awareness. Understanding the intercon and how that connects our interconnection when we are more whole in the intra connection aspect, our relationship one with another, really, as I said at the beginning, with all of life, with our with nature, with this beautiful planet, with this amazing universe. That is enhanced, it comes more into a natural, uncontrived. Uh, harmony, a deeper listening, and so on. That connection is through spirit, energy, mind, and body. And finally, in this principle, it says, through natural expansive attention. So I like to reference expansive attention because we have and it has been part of meditative traditions, and especially in Zen, and I'm trying to help transform that, to bring that into the 21st century. No, it's not a singular effort on my part. <laughs> but the expansive nature of attention is often when you do the practices that are sometimes called concentration practices. I'm not saying they're bad or wrong or don't do them. Absolutely. What I'm saying is that the limiting nature holds the focus in the cognitive field, in the prefrontal cortex, a lot. And what we want to feel through our contemplative practice, in my, in my view, in my opinion, is to feel that more through the whole system of our being, to let that wholeness, to let that healing, to let that restoration take place through the whole of our being, which is not just the whole of this physical being. It's the whole of our energetic being, all the lines of intelligence that we have, that we each of us uniquely have gifts within, and, uh, and so you bring the, the kindness of your focused attention in an expansive way. As I said a little earlier, yeah, you can, you can bring the focus of the attention just a little forward to the information that you're getting through the senses, that you're getting through the emotional field, that you're getting through the cognitive and mental fields. It's not dismissing them at all. It's not pushing them back. It's just bringing expansive attention forward. So there you go. That's being, that's being present in this aspect of our integration. So this one has been a very interesting principle to work with. And I'll tell you a little story about that. Practice under doing. Practice within approximately 70% of your capacity and range of motion. By doing so, enables you to be mindfully present and makes it possible to stay connected with feeling and flow. Releases excess tension. Optimizes the benefit of practice. Learn the value of underdoing. This is been a hard one to sell, <laughs> if I can say. So I've had the, the privilege and really the joy in 
over the years in from time to time in working in corporate uh, working with uh, corporate beings if we can call them that they're all we're all human beings but they're in a corporate fold and when I bring about contemplative practices to them and and start to talk about underdoing they say hey w wait a minute we're all about productivity we can't underdo and I say well first of all this is about how to get the optimization of your somatic practice that we're going to do but on the other side of things, learning how to optimize your movement by underdoing range of motion and sometimes in the cognitive field will allow for a couple of things. And among those is longevity and clarity, greater clarity and depth of perception about the purpose of your practice. So. Practicing underdoing, working with motion within 70% of your capacity and range of motion is an interesting and not too difficult principle to understand. So if my ability, if this is 100% of my range of motion, I want to practice within 70%, this is the flow of that motion. I'm practicing an opening and closing gesture for me uniquely what is 70%, not 100%, but approximately. This is not, a, again, not a rigid take on numbers or percentage, but, but underdoing range of motion so you can stay present in feeling. You'll notice that in some gestures and some things that you do, maybe you're working out in the gym and, or running and you, for a, a little while, you work at 100%. But how long is 100% sustainable? Maybe it is appropriate at certain points, but to allow for longevity and allow for a continuity of practice over time, if you can learn the skill of underdoing, learn the value of underdoing, you will actually end up being more productive. And that productivity will come with greater uh, mental and emotional benefits that I hope you directly experience as you engage in contemplative practice. And if you understand, and it's not about kind of appropriating all of those and getting all of those exactly right, <laughs> but allowing an integration to take place. That's why we call this integrating embodied mindfulness. So this one is kind of best taken up in our direct practical engagement with our Qigong. But just hold that for a moment. Practicing underdoing, practicing the movement within 70% of your capacity uh, and range of motion. But in integrating the practices, you will hopefully learn the value, the value of practicing in this way and using this principle. Then later on, you can see whether it is applicable to other aspects or domains of your life and engagement. That is underdoing, working with 70%. So this principle is called cultivating dynamic relaxation. So cultivating dynamic relaxation, attention, that is attention, without tension or laxity or unneeded effort. That's the quality of cultivating dynamic relaxation. This is the foundation for skillful and wise effort in any activity. Dynamic relaxation has the quality of continuity of wakeful presence known in Aikido as Zanshen. It is the stability that arises from effortless conscious relaxation. 
When we cultivate dynamic relaxation through our practice and in our lives, we are orienting our being in such a way that there's a balance, not a, not a rigid state, but a balance between that, uh, between tension and between laxity. That also includes unneeded effort, an unnecessary effort. I said that this is the foundation for skillful and wise effort in any activity. It certainly is in, the, in all the arts that I've practiced over the years, in the Chinese internal arts of Tai Chi and Bagua, Xing Yi, and, uh, and of certainly of Qigong, but also in Aikido and other martial arts. If you bring too much tension, it's not sustainable. If you're too lax, that's not sustainable either. So we look in our practice to find the balance, the, the flow between those particular aspects. And it is doable, it is gettable as we connect with this principle of cultivating dynamic relaxation. So again, this word cultivate is one of engagement, of one of investigation, of one directly experiencing what it is to dynamically relax. And as I said in the first principle, that is one where we're working with intention to connect with, to connect with this sense of feeling of being present where you're not going to sleep, but you're, you know, you're not overly anxious, you're not overly active. It is a quality of poise, as we'll come to see. In Aikido, the word that I used here is zanshin. I've always loved this word. Zanshin means a sense of continuity of connection. In Aikido, you may know, and in Judo, and certain things, there are uh, throws and extensions. The Zanshin aspect of this for us is a sense of connection of the fluid membrane of feeling. In, the, in Aikido, we might do a throw, but then you don't just drop your attention from that and to the field all around you. There's a certain kind of quality of poise, that presence awareness that's called zanshin. So from here, the attention is not singularly in your effort here, but is more globally present. It's a certain kind of stability. It's a stability that arises in your being by not being too lax, not being too tense, but finding for yourself uniquely and developing and cultivating that dynamic relaxation. That's a very important principle. Well, let me say that they're all, they all uniquely have their, um, their values. And again, thinking of this not in a sequence, but in the wheel of presence. Okay, in our practice, as we work with this, this genuine wholeness, this genuine integration here, this principle says, allow the feeling of openness. And along with the feeling of openness comes lengthening, deepening and expanding from within, from within our unique energy and physical beings. So cultivating, or as we cultivate relaxed, non-dual field awareness, this is all part of this allowing the feeling of openness. Cultivate the feeling of openness and expansion by connecting awareness to direct experience. Use Qigong forms as a gateway to connecting to the innate intelligence of your organism, the microcosm, simultaneous 
to universal intelligence, or the Tao, the macrocosm. Learn how to let go and trust this knowing being. In our practice, the transformational aspect of doing our Qigong as somatic integration, as integrating embodied mindfulness, a number of things happen, can happen right away. The experience that is potential immediately as we soften, open, lengthen, and feel that natural expansion that happens in the flow of pulse of breath. And in doing so, that benefit is immediately accessible to us. But one of the beautiful things about practicing these integrative gestures and the qigong that, we're, that we do and are going to do is that it also has an accumulative effect. So you begin to accumulate the feeling of the integration. And that's why I said, you know, we have, we connect, we connect the, uh, the thought, the awareness aspect with direct experience. Cultivate the feeling of openness and expansion. We use the Qigong forms as a gateway. Even as uh, Morie Weishaber, the founder of Aikido, says, Aikido is the practice of principles. And our Qigong is the same. Qigong is the practice and the integration, the embodiment of these principles. When we do so, we're connecting with and allowing the expression of this natural intelligence of our being, which is, of course, intimately connected with universal intelligence. It's not other than. The Tao is not other than the intelligence of the being that we are. Yes, the expression of that and the connection with that in greater fullness, greater wholeness, takes a little bit of time. It's an ongoing, ever-evolving, evolutionary, revolutionary process that we're engaged in. So, in a way, when I say we let go to this knowing being, we're letting go into the intelligence that we are. This contemplative aspect is, is one of the pure beauties of, of how we engage in meditation, how we engage in the somatic practices of our Qigong and Neigong. The qualities of grounded and centered, dignified presence arise when you practice this Qigong as embodied mindfulness. Consciously embodying inner balance and equanimity builds strength and tone of the brain and nervous system. Developing stability of the structural and energetic systems of the organism supports the feeling of poise and of well-being. Allow the feeling of openness and develop that is to cultivate the feeling of poise. Talked about the alignment, the center line. There's also the center field. So when we're, cent when we're centering, it has the dynamics of these dimensions of vertical and spherical alignment. These are kind of like advanced teachings of of both the internal arts and of some of the aspects of the martial arts. The qualities of grounded and centered and, I like to say, dignified. Dignified presence. When we sit, this is a gesture of dignity. When we move with the qualities of the integration of the principles and the aspects of the elements of alignment, we're really working with this expression 
uh, almost like a dance, but a healing one for us uh, collectively and individually. The difference in, it's the difference in just doing a form for the form's sake and practicing our Qigong as embodied mindfulness. And that's why I use that term, integrating embodied mindfulness. Consciously, purposefully, so to speak, Embodying inner balance and equanimity builds strength and tone of the brain and nervous system. Those of you that have read the beautiful book, The Telomere Effect, understand that contemplative practices and the integration that, we're do, that we are doing and that we're going to do in our Qigong helps to actually lengthen telomeres to bring about the greater uh, health of that very fine, sometimes microscopic, <laughs> always microscopic level of the cellular nature of our being and of our DNA. So this, the practices have the potential, have the, pot uh, the capacity to really heal the nervous system, to heal us on that deep level. So that's why even connecting in the settling of our standing meditation and relative stillness there, but also in the movement, heals and restores and connects you directly to the feeling of poise and of well-being. So the more you cultivate that feeling of poise and well-being, the more it's a part of your neurobiology. This principle is called listen to the chi, the life force, and develop trust in this natural intelligence. Authentic transformation evolves from balanced and skillful endeavor that harmonizes intention, developing skill and intuitive awareness. Nourish your being through practice. This is the confluence of the, st of the streams of Qigong and meditation embodiment and presence. This is Qigong Dharma. Meditation, contemplation, and the Qigong practices, especially the way that I'm introducing them and have practiced them in the traditions of Zen, Vipassana, and to a certain degree in the, uh, uh, in the Tibetan systems as well. These bring about that coherency that I'm talking about. And the listening to the chi is the, in a way, may I say, the mystical nature of contemplative practice as it's been engaged with by cultures all over the world for millennia, for centuries of time. The skill of listening, of learning how to listen to life force by any name is a way of settling in and being mindfully present, not projecting the concept first upon the direct experience. That's why these practices take time. They're learned and practiced in circular fashion and in layered fashion. And because the transformation works with balance as a fluid nature, the skillful endeavor harmonizes intention with intuitive awareness. Intuitive awareness, another way of saying that, is first-person experience, this direct learning how to trust direct first-person experience. So. I always say that you can nourish your being through practice. This is the nature of bhavana. This is the nature of cultivation. And I hope to share with you in our practicum the way to skillfully do this, that um, you can gradually work with the practice in a way that's really um, helpful to your lifestyle. And then as you see the value of it, that you'll be able to bring your attention and deepen in those 
uh, various practices, the confluence of contemplation and as a meditative art, as, as embodied mindfulness, and the actions that we're doing, the somatic practices that we call qigong, negong, and dao yin. This is the nature of what we call qigong dharma. So it's been a pleasure to share this with you and thank you for hanging with me as we kind of work through more the lecture aspect of this engagement with principles that we will somatically connect with. And I want to invite Tia to come back on and help us to both uh, moderate and to engage. So if you have some reflection here, if you have some, some questions, we have about uh, a little less than 15 minutes to engage with those. Thank you. We do have a few questions. The first question says, thank you for your talk. Could you please talk more about the relationship between cultivating versus simply observing? Yes, thank you very much. That's great. So the cultivation between, uh, between working with particular aspects of the breath or your meditative practice and Wu Wei, which means effortless effort, uh, it means a way of engagement that is very similar to that presence awareness that we began to explore in the talk. So when you connect with the, uh, with the settling into this quality of mindfulness, it's not engaging in the cultivation at that point. There's a time for cultivation, and there's a time for just relaxing, letting go into being, which by any other name we can call mindfulness, we can call it that settling into pres the presence awareness or deep witness, um, that is that non-dual field awareness, which is resting in that space beyond subject and object. I hope that's a useful explanation. Thank you. The next question asks about the yin-yang symbol that you're wearing on your cloak and invites you to speak a bit more about the expansion and contraction principles. <laughs> sure. Every, everything has within its qualities the yin and yang nature, that is the nature of everything in manifestation, whether it seems static or whether it's fluid movement. So yin is receptive qualities. And I'm just speaking in broad, in broad terms, right? They're like, it's like a shorthand. Uh, and the yang is uh, positive, the yin is receptive, and the interesting thing about the yin-yang symbol is that there is, um, through the center in that fluid um, uh, sine wave that's going up <laughs> like that, is the space of non-dual presence. So it's the balance between. It's not the getting rid of the positive or the negative. It is a, um, a resting in the space between. So the yin-yang symbol is the, is the representative of the nature of balance, which is neither, uh, uh, which is certainly not fixed, is fluid, is ever moving, because the nature of the universe is ever moving, is expansion on the manifest level. Thank you, Tisha. The next question is an amalgamation of several people's questions in which people are asking about your uh, insights regarding how to work with what you meet inside your thoughts and emotions and physical sensations when you're doing your Tai Chi practice or Qigong practice. And the three things that have been mentioned in the questions or if you meet a racing mind or an agitated nervous system, 
The second is if you meet pain or fatigue. And the third is if it's just hard to become uh, aware of your body because you've been living in a coping mechanism of being numb or separate from sensations of the body due to past trauma that is still rather raw and uh, difficult to relate to in the body. Mm -hmm. Beautiful and profound question. Let's see if we can integrate those, those aspects. The, the, our practice of Qigong by its nature and by the forms, the, certainly the way I teach it, and I'm sure the way other teachers uh, teach it as well, that it, it is slower, generally speaking. That's just a general uh, way of speaking about it because, you know, some practices are a little more energetic. There are energetic Qigong practices. There are very smooth and settling practices. So the transition between your life and your practice, that might take a few moments. And when we do our practicum, you'll see a gateway practice, which I call radiant body breathing. And then we also practice standing in such a way that um, allows this sense of settling, being present in the body and transitioning from the uh, activity of the sympathetic nervous system while activating the qualities and the presence of the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we do that, um, it has a direct impact. It helps to kind of bring those waters of flow and activity into greater uh, wholeness, not necessarily perfect stillness, but a greater sense of settledness in presence. So that's the first one. What was the second one, Tia? The second one was pain and discomfort and fatigue. Pain and discomfort may be part of, uh, of practicing, and that's why we work with, in our Qigong, working with 70% range of motion. Your 70% of range of motion is unique to you. And that's why when we do the practices like we do, we're going to be working with pulsing, which is not working with the muscular system. Well, yes, of course it is working with the muscular system. But it's not, it's not bringing that tension and not excess laxity to this so that the practices for the most part can be comfortable and hopefully without pain. When practicing, we never, in practicing our Qigong, we never move to or through the threshold of pain. In other words, if you're lifting your arm up and that's too much, well then underdo the range of motion. That's the principle of underdoing range of motion. You craft and allow the expression of the form to work with the principle. And then the third aspect was one of trauma. Um, we as human beings have all in various degrees um, had, had certain kinds of trauma and those are physical and emotional, mental, energetic. The practice of our Qigong in the way that I'm guiding us, I think will open you into um, uh, it will, will not open you into the rawness of your trauma, but allow you to open and breathe with to gradually heal the fabric of your body by connecting with the signatures of trauma in your body and just breathing, just breathing with it. I don't want to oversimplify the, the, that process but that's essentially it. By working with underdoing the skill of the practice, your intention, your intention for wholeness, for wellness, and then working with the pulses in the way that we do can heal trauma. It doesn't necessarily get rid of trauma, but it helps to bring a new perspective in your felt sense, in your somatic reality. 
Thank you. The next question asks about meeting an invisible wall inside oneself when engaging in practice. The question says, what would you invite people to do when they encounter a wall that has been built up inside them to help them stay separate from difficulties and sensations that they don't know how to cope with? How would you invite people to work with that wall? Beautiful. What a, uh, what a beautiful Zen koan. Mm -hmm. So I often, we often talk about koans in Zen as being these kind of puzzles. In the way that I do our Qigong Dharma in relationship to the Zen, our Zen and our koan is a somatic koan as well. So any particular boundary or wall that you meet in your practice is just a step along the way. Just like it wasn't always that way, it probably will not always be that way. So the skill of the practice is, is gaining, um, or bringing, I should say, bringing patience to your practice, just being able to be present with the feeling that is here right now, not trying to move over those boundaries or those perceived boundaries. They may be real in some kind of mental, emotional, and somatic, traumatic way, but this is a skillful means that will help you to navigate the, um, the boundary that you are. There is, I, I want to say that as you practice, your development is going to be uniquely yours. There is no like, okay, after 10 weeks of practice, you know you're completely healed and, and everything is all right with you. Um, maybe if it was great, as I said, sometimes you practice and right away you feel some uh, amazing openness, but also the accumulative effect of your integrative practice, your qigong, will uh, take place. And sometimes it takes place over days, weeks, years, over a lifetime. Be patient. Uh, learn to trust and feel your own being. Thank you. Our final question has to do with the lineages that you've shared and the transmission of the traditions. If you would speak to the history of where the traditions originated, and then how they were taught from one generation to another. Wonderful. Great. And there's no short answer to that one. <laughs> but let me, let me just give it a little try. Of course, out of the Buddhist tradition with Siddhartha Gautama, you know, some 2,600 years ago, he was known as a, as a yogi. So he practiced in the various forms of yoga that were there then, not so much the forms of hatha yoga that we now have, but other forms for concentration and, and uh, meditation, insight, uh, wisdom, kriya, clearing, and so on. Those practices have continued to evolve to a certain degree, and we have access to those. When, uh, when the practices, when the Buddhist practice went into China. Um, it did so over a long period of time, but probably the most famous contributor is known as Bodhidharma, someplace in between the 5th and 6th centuries CE. And he brought, whether he was introduced there or whether, it, uh, whether he brought those with, with him, kind of my own feeling uh, is that he came in contact with these practices in China, they became part of the fabric of Buddhist meditation at the time, Chan, as it was called. And uh, the Taoist practitioners just continued, you know, with their various lineages of the integration of health practices and meditation martial arts practices as well. So we don't have a firm, you know, this is absolutely the truth about this. Mm -hmm. in terms of the, the lineage. But we have all of this uh, coming together in these very unique times. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. And I have been a cross trainer <laughs> between uh, the traditions of health and the traditions of the internal arts and the martial arts to weave together the radiant heart qigong as a way that brings about the best and evolving qualities that work with uh, the best that we have in neuroscience and, and modern science and anatomy with the ancient arts and the subtler recognition of the contemplative practices to bring us more uh, vibrantly uh, awake and aware and healing and recognizing creativity and our potential. So I hope that was uh, useful in just a kind of a broad picture. Those practices from China didn't necessarily cross over to uh, Japan, but Japan's had its own kind of somatic thing. Tija, thank you for your informative and engaging presentation. We very much look forward to being with you again in the sessions in which you're guiding us through practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tia. Take good care, everyone. Look forward to being with you.